from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Her latest book is The Good Daughter, and it's um, a nail-biting tale about the Quins of Pikeville, Georgia. Um, and the story takes us back in time to a horrific crime that tore her family apart. And it's a cold case that becomes um, less so 28 years later when a second murder drudges up terrible memories and long buried secrets. And if you don't have it, you can buy a copy here. I'm not going to give any more of the story away. And one of the bonuses of being at the festival is that you can buy the book and you can get a copy signed. Um, in addition to her writing, uh, Karen is an advocate for libraries. Um, she's the founder of the Save the Libraries Project, which is an organization that raises money for um, DeKalb County Library Foundation in Georgia, which is her home state. Um, we are thrilled to have Karen with us here today to tell about us about herself, her writing, her latest book, and perhaps what we can look forward to in the next one. So please join me in welcoming Karen Slaughter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nora. And also thank you to the wonderful volunteers here today uh, who've been doing such a great job. Uh, authors are basically incapable of doing anything on their own. Um, and so they've been telling us, you can stay here for 10 minutes, you can eat here, you can go to the bathroom. And now <laughs> they brought me here. Uh, so we have them to thank for that. Uh, hopefully this isn't it. I'll eventually end up at the airport. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, normally when I, I do events, I don't really, I don't read from my book unless someone wants me to, uh, and then I only read from the very end. So does anyone want me to read? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, so what I do is I just, I'm from the South, I'm from Georgia, so I do what all good Southerners do. I make fun of my family. Um, I tell you a little bit about my writing process, uh, and then hopefully by then I've talked long enough so that you can ask some questions. I will say, uh, please don't give spoilers. Like if a character you loved is no longer in a series or something like that, please don't ask about that. You can email me directly from my website or Facebook. Um, if you're here to beat me up because of that, uh, my publicist is right here. <laughs> Uh, and it was her decision. <clears throat> so, or one of the many helpful volunteers. They're in the purple shirts. Uh, but I, since Nora, and also thank you so much, Nora, um, for volunteering to do this, because, you know, it's f football season, right? It started today, so uh, to show up here is a big thing. Um, but uh, I, I am a big library supporter, not just my local library, which is DeKalb County in Georgia, um, but I, the, the Save the Libraries project does give block grants to other libraries across the country and actually in the United States and England and the Netherlands. And we tried in France, but they didn't understand libraries needing money. They said, we don't, we don't do that. We just raise taxes. Why don't you do that in America? <laughs> Um, and I said, this is why people hate France. Uh, but uh, we do try to give internationally. To date, we've raised over $300,000 for libraries. Um, so thank you. And we try to give block grants, uh, and we tell them, do what you want. If you need to paint the place, if you need a reading program for kids, whatever you need, um, don't not for vacation. We had to be really specific about that because someone ended up in Tahiti. Uh, but uh, she got a, an amazing tan, I will say that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a big supporter of libraries, though I don't necessarily like children. I find them kind of um, self-centered. Um, <laughs> the poor motor control, I, do, I just, uh, you know, when they're, they're 25 and up, yes. but. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I support libraries, because children are so selfish, and if they read books, they start to understand that there's a world outside of them. You know, Harold has a purple crayon. I have a purple crayon. So this is not the only purple crayon in the world, you know? It's something as basic as that. And if I think about the books that librarians gave me, like uh, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, or uh, all of Flannery O'Connor, uh, gone with the Wind, you know, for all its flaws. 
Uh, the books that I grew up loving and reading have really informed uh, my life as a writer. Uh, no more so than Flowers in the Attic, which I thought was a beautiful love story until I was in my early 20s. And then I thought, <laughs> someone said something about incest, and I was like, what? <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm probably the only person here with Game of Thrones. I was like, yeah, I see it. I see it. Uh, so, you know, also the, the important thing about libraries is children who learn to read do better in school. If they do better in school, then they go to college. If they go to college, they get better jobs, then they pay higher taxes. So this is any, something a Republican, a Libertarian, or a Democrat, or a Communist, anybody can understand that. It's such a small investment. There's also kind of all kinds of studies about the brains of children. Uh, that children who read develop pathways in their brain for critical thinking that children who do not read fluently never will develop. If you talk to anyone in the criminal justice system, something like 80% of all kids who have contact with the law or with uh, the criminal justice system are functionally illiterate. So think about how much cheaper it would be just to put a book in their hands. And that's what we try to do. Um, so, you know, even though I don't like children, I do want them to be able to pay for my Social Security, <laughs> uh, Medicare, all of that stuff that I'm going to need later on. Uh, and you may say, well, you're an author too, so you want libraries to be open because they buy your books. Yes, it's all very self-serving, uh, <laughs> but we are a nonprofit. Uh, so thank you for listening to my little spiel about libraries. Um, like I said, I grew up in a, a small South Georgia town. I'm the youngest of three girls. Um, my sisters are, are, you know, really, uh, when I was growing up, were horrible, hateful people. Uh, and when people say, why are you so drawn to violence? I say, because I lived it. Uh, we did things like uh, we beat each other, we spit in each other's faces. I broke my sister's leg once. Um, I told her, I said, if you don't give me back my Kate Jackson trading card, I'm going to break your leg. She would not give it back, I broke her leg. So from a very early age, I've been a person of my word. Uh, but you know, when you, when you live in the South, especially in Georgia, when you say you go on vacation, it, it's like when you go to a restaurant and you order a Coke, they say diet or regular, because Coke is what soda is. Well, vacation means Florida and it means specifically the Redneck Riviera, which is the Florida Panhandle. So every summer we would go there, and uh, my dad, my dad was a, a, I love him to death, but he was a really tough dad, and he was the original storyteller in our family, and most of his stories had cautionary tales. You know, he had three girls, so he had to keep us in line. Uh, so one of his favorites was about the little girl who touched the thermostat and died. <laughs> or the little girl who left the refrigerator door open and died. <laughs> and so when we would go to Florida, my dad would be in the front seat and he would have a cigarette in one hand and a glass of scotch in the other, and he would drive with his knees. And he would drive very, it was a six hour trip. He always wanted to make it in under five hours. Uh, and so he didn't let us turn on the air conditioning because that wasted gas. So he would roll the windows down and you know, it was about 120,000 degrees outside, and I would be in the back seat on the hump because I'm the youngest. And I, I shouldn't complain because I've got remarkably strong thighs because I just had to <laughs> hold everything together. And my sisters were on either side of me, and, you know, my dad didn't believe in the radio because he thought it wasted gas. Uh, most of the trip was quiet car because we would get in fights, you know, she's touched me, she's breathing on me, she's thinking about me. And we would start slapping each other, and my dad would pull over, and the rule was we all got spanked no matter what. Uh, but the joke was on him, because our, our thighs were basically numb from sitting on the back of those vinyl seats. And we would get up, and it would sound like Velcro. Um, so he was spanking basically dead nerves there. Uh, but one of the ways that he kind of transported us away from the heat and the oppression was he would tell us stories. And he, he loved making fun of his family, because uh, that's what you do when you're in the South, uh, is you just make fun of people uh, who are in your family, though it's very rude if someone makes fun of your family. I want you to know that. Uh, and my dad would talk about uh, my Aunt Bert. And my Aunt Bert, uh, she, had a, she was born with a hair lip. 
uh, and the church raised money to get it fixed, but she would not get it fixed because she said that it was she was touched by Jesus when she was born. And um, so she worked at the local bingo parlor, and she would get up there, and she would call out the numbers on the balls, and she would say, be hoardy whore, <laughs> or I shitty shit. <laughs> and I would remember as a kid hearing my dad tell this story and thinking, holy crap, if you tell stories, you can curse. <laughs> and if you read my books, I curse all the time. There's a, I get a lot of letters for that. You know, the child molesters, the murderers, the rapists, they're okay, but God forbid you should have a woman say the F word. <laughs> so that, that's kind of something that shaped me as a writer, is, is my dad telling these stories. Because he grew up very poor, literally dirt poor. Uh, he was one of nine kids. Uh, his mother and father uh, were very poor. They lived in, they squatted in shacks. And when the owner of the shack would come, uh, sometimes with a shotgun and say, you got to move your family out. They would take the boards with them so at the next shack they wouldn't have to sleep in the dirt. And, and my grandfather was a really horrible person. He was kicked out of the clan for not taking care of his family. Uh, if you wondered if they had standards, apparently that's the one. Um, and, uh, you know, it wasn't a very good life for my grandmother. But the one thing that the kids always tried to do was tell her a story that would make her laugh or make her smile. So that was something that really, very early on, I, I learned as a kid was, you know, if you can make grandma happy, then you've won the day. And she loved this magazine called True Crime Magazine. Do you guys, maybe some older people here remember True Crime? It was basically snuff porn. Uh, and there was always like the last line would say she should have listened to her husband or her father was right. Uh, and it was all about women getting murdered, just constantly murdered and ravished and all these things. And the magazine was only available on the bad side of town where we grew up, at the Piggly Wiggly, because they carry that kind of trash. <laughs> and so every Sunday, my grandmother would go to church, and then she would go to the Piggly Wiggly and get this magazine, the latest edition. Then she would go to our Kroger to get our food. And then she would go home and she would cook our Sunday dinner and she would read the magazine while dinner was cooking. Well, then we would pull up and, you know, we'd go inside. And this was back when you didn't really have to see children, so we had to disappear once we kissed her cheek. And we would go and we would look for that magazine. And we would read True Crime magazine. And every Sunday night, we just cried ourselves to sleep. And our parents thought it was because of the sermon, right, that we had seen, we'd heard that, that Sunday morning. But it was because we were afraid there was going to be a hook on the door. And my dad didn't help matters because you know, he loved scaring us. You know, at Christmas where your dad gets up and he's like on the roof, you know, ho, ho, ho. He would do that in the summertime. <laughs> and he would say, oh, that's the goblin who eats little girls who don't listen to their father. Uh, so, you know, we had this sense of terror and we had this sense of, uh, you know, reading crime stories was something you should be ashamed of. Uh, but one thing we could all agree on was when you went to church on Sunday, you showed your best face. And my grandmother loved taking us to church. It was her favorite thing to do. And one Sunday, Easter Sunday, because my parents were really careful, because my grandmother's church was literally one generation away from snake handling. And my grandmother would say, oh, preacher didn't believe enough, you know, and he died uh, from snake bit. Uh, and um, so we would go to church with my grandmother on Easter Sunday, and the only reason we were there was to show off, right, so she could show what good kids we were and that we had good manners. And we were all in those pink dresses and the white shoes and the underwear with the ruffles, which was weird. My sister was 16. Um, <laughs> she got a lot of phone numbers. Uh, but, um, you know, my grandma would introduce us to her friends after the service, and this was a real service. It was four hours, right? Uh, and we weren't allowed to go to the bathroom or talk or draw on anything, so basically this is how I learned how to sleep with my eyes open. Uh, but she would introduce us, and she would say, this is Mrs. Smith or this is Mrs. Jones. And as soon as the woman would turn her back, my grandmother would say something awful, like, well, you know she drinks. <laughs> or you know her husband's a cheat. And so I had this sense from a very early age that everybody had a deep, dark secret. And if you read my books, everybody has a deep, dark secret. I have my grandmother to thank for that. 
Um, but the, the Christmas before she died, now it, it, I'm sure there are some Southerners in here, and you know Southern grandmothers are incredibly hard to please. Um, and my grandmother was right up there with them. Yeah, I remember my dad bought her a frying pan, and she found out it cost $12, and she made him hang it on the wall because she said anything that expensive should be art. Uh, <laughs> And she had like a closet full of hats that were too expensive to wear. So th this was the type of, of woman she was. Uh, you know, or like, you know, you'd say to her, oh, Grandma, your hair looks nice. And she'd say, do you mean it didn't look nice before? <laughs> so at Christmas, we decided we were going to try to get her something nice. And, you know, by then my dad had kind of given up after the frying pan incident. Uh, and so I said, well, why don't we get her a subscription to True Crime Magazine, since she loves to read it. That way she doesn't have to go to the Piggly Wiggly on the bad side of town. And my dad was like, you know, okay, well, at least we know she reads it. And so Christmas morning rolled around, and I couldn't wait. I was just so excited about this gift we got from our grandmother. I, I told you I'm the youngest, so you know I like to ruin surprises. Uh, so we were sitting at the breakfast table and my dad's rule was we could not open presents until he was finished with breakfast which was usually about 1 p.m. and I just I, I just couldn't stop I just said grandma grandma guess what we got you for Christmas and she said what already disappointed and I said we got you a subscription to true crime magazine so you don't have to go to the piggly wiggly on the bad side of town and she was silent which was very strange and she just looked at me, and then her, her bottom lip started to quiver, and she started to cry, just these tears pouring down her face, and her head dropped into her, hand, her hands, and she really just started to sob. And my dad got up, and he said, Mama, you know, are you okay? Because we just thought, oh, my God, we've finally gotten her something that's moved her that she's, she wants. Oh my, this is like a magical Christmas moment. And she looked at my dad and she said, I do not want the postman to know I read that. <laughs> and so the next business day, uh, my dad had to cancel the magazine subscription. It cost more to cancel it than it did to get the subscription originally, so I think this happened a lot. Uh, I think a lot of women were ashamed. Um, so I stand up here before you knowing how ashamed my grandmother would be, not just that I'm wearing pants, but that uh, I'm not at home watching uh, Georgia football. There, there are many strikes for me being up here, but mostly that I write the kind of books she would love to read, but she would be horrified to know people loved, that people would know that she loved them. Uh, but when my grandmother passed away, it was a really difficult time for us, um, and because we did, we loved her so much, and She's buried in the Sodom Cemetery in South Georgia, where all the slaughters are buried. And there's a preacher buried there, the snake handler. Uh, and he was so concerned that the rapture would come and he would be forgotten about that he was buried with a telephone. And there was an actual telephone in the coffin and a, a telephone line went out of his grave and up to a telephone pole. And uh, this was before cell phones obviously. And I guess, you know, it's sort of like Harry Potter is the most powerful magician in the world, but he still needs glasses. <laughs> this guy thought Jesus and God would bring the rapture, but, you know, I got to call and make sure they don't forget about me. I don't know what was on his conscience, but there's more going on than being snake bit with that fella. Uh, but it terrified us, of course, to think about a dead man in a coffin with a telephone, right? And my dad loved that. He delighted in it. Uh, and so whenever we would go visit my grandmother, she was buried up here, the preacher was buried here, and the parking lot was here. Well, you know, normally you would go like straight across to see my grandmother, but my dad always made us go all the way around and under the preacher's telephone line. You remember when um, telephones sounded like bells? So one time we were walking under this telephone line, me, my middle sister, my older sister, and my dad was behind us and he had a bell. And he rang that bell and it, it's been years of therapy. None of us quite remember what was going on. Um, the, the next thing after the sound of that bell that any of us recall 
is screaming on the floorboard of the car covered in urine. <laughs> and so when people tell me, your books really scare me, I think at least you are not covered in urine. <laughs> so that's the kind of life I had growing up. Um, it, so people always say, well, why do you write the way you write? That's why. Um, I, I am grateful for my, my, the way I was raised, though. I think that between, you know, my, my grandmother and my dad and my family, and I mean, I can hold my own in a fight thanks to my sisters, but I do think that we just have that storytelling ability in our family. Um, and I remember uh, a long time ago, this reporter from the Washington Post came to interview me, and we were up in the, the mountains. I have a cabin up in North Georgia where I go to do my writing. And my dad lives down the, the way. And, you know, he knew that I had somebody there. And so he came by to see if we needed anything. And I had told the reporter all these stories about my dad. You know, like the time I had a spend a night party. It's the last one I ever had. Uh, my dad thought it would be funny to put a ladder up against the window and put a, a sheet on his head like a ghost. Um, but for some reason, instead of cutting the eye holes, he used black magic marker. And then he got caught uh, when he was climbing the ladder. And so we were just sitting there uh, minding our own business, and a ladder came through the window, <laughs> which he thought was even funnier than the original plan. Uh, but uh, so this woman who interviewed me, she met my dad, and he was perfectly normal. I mean, anybody who has a parent like this knows that they, they can pass for normal. And he was normal for about 30 minutes. And she just kind of, I could see her reporter brain saying, what's going on here? She, she fed me a line. Uh, she's trying to, you know, gin up that Southern thing. And then she started to leave, and she asked my dad the best way to get back. And he said, well, you know, you can go left out of the driveway, but the more scenic route is you go right. And you cross over a bridge, and this is not the bridge where that man was caught molesting the boy. It's the one where the body was found that was burned. So go fast over that one. And then the next one, you can see where they dragged this body. And then she was looking at me, because, you know, the most important, the most interesting part of an interview is always when the tape report quarters off and the pencil's down. And she just looked at me like, so that's my dad. So people who say, you look so normal, I can't believe you write these books. That's why I learned from my father. Um, I'll talk a little bit about The Good Daughter. Um, I, you know, a lot of times people want to know where do writers get their ideas. Most of the time we lie because we don't know. They just, they just happen. You know, suddenly you're walking down the street or you're in your car and especially if you write crime fiction you know if you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off you instantly think of five different ways to murder somebody <laughs> but for me I, I just a lot of times it starts with character and the first character I thought about in The Good Daughter is a character named Gamma uh, she's the mother of two girls we meet in the opening chapter of the book she's married to a fellow named Rusty who's a lawyer but Gamma is not her real name, it's her nickname, because she worked at Fermilab and she worked at NASA in the 60s and 70s uh, as a scientist, which, as we all know, was a very difficult time for a woman to be in STEM. It, it's a little better now, we can at least say that. Uh, and she chose to give up that life and move home and take care of her ailing parents. And she ended up in a mountain town in, South, in North Georgia called Pikeville, uh, which is loosely based on a lot of towns up in North Georgia that I know about, but not one specific one. Uh, so if you think it's Blue Ridge, it's actually Epworth. And if you think it's Epworth, it's actually Blue Ridge. Because um, I still have to go up there and write. Uh, but I, I thought about this character a lot. And th there's a line that I wrote down about her three years ago. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm a real nerd. I've got like a waterproof notepad in my shower. And it just stays up there, and I write things. I clean the shower. Don't judge. But, you know, I just I write notes to myself in different lines. And there was this one line that, that uh, came to me, because when I was in ninth grade, my ninth grade English teacher became the most important person in my life. She was an amazing woman. Um, she was very mean, which, as you can gather, I respond well to. Um, and we wanted to please her. You know, when people talk about 
performance pay and how to evaluate teachers and that sort of thing. I think she would get the worst evaluations because the kids were just scared of her, but she was the best teacher. Because I think you should be a little scared of your teachers. I think you should respect their authority. And she commanded the classroom, but she also said to me something that no one had ever said to me in my life. She, she said, you're a good writer, but you could be better. And of course I thought, I'm pretty damn good, you know, what are you talking about? But she put books in my hands and said, the way you learn to, to, you know, you're a writer or you're not, right? And you're a writer, and you need to learn how to hone your craft. And the way, best way to do that is through reading. And she gave me these amazing books, and she just really fostered my love of reading and writing and learning from what I read. You know, the, the mind is a, a muscle that you have to keep training. And I always say when people say, I want to be a writer, that th they need to read, because that's what's important. That's wh that makes you aware of how story works and what you like in a book or don't like in a book, teaches you something. Uh, and so she was the one who said that to me and who really put this passion into me about being a better writer. And every book I start, I think about her, and I want to be better every time. But it, it started in ninth grade, and she was with me throughout the last 17 years of my career. She was the second person after my father. I told about my book deal when I first got published, and she was always there. And she would sometimes when I would travel, she would send me postcards to wait for me at the hotel and tell me how proud she was. But she passed away a couple of years ago, and it was really hard to lose her. Uh, but the thing is... It, a friend of mine said at the time, you know, when someone dies, your relationship with them doesn't end. And I, I found that to be true. And, and, and it actually, it felt like it deepened. And I think the reason it deepened is she wasn't there to tell me all the things I was doing wrong. Because uh, she was a difficult woman. And, you know, even literally on her deathbed, someone had given her a box of chocolates, you know, those fancy handmade chocolates. I ate them all. She was sick. Um, but uh, there was like a little note explaining, you know, the cow's name was Harvey, who gave the milk for this. You know, that, that kind of crap they do to justify, like, having to pay $10 for one piece of chocolate. But there was an apostrophe error in, in, the, in the note. And she wanted me to write a letter to the company to tell them that they, this was embarrassing them. And their chocolates were otherwise good. Um, but, you know, they needed to represent themselves better, and grammar is important. And so we did that, and, and, and that was just the kind of person she was. And, and you know, as a, a, as a society, we're wired to appreciate men who are really intelligent, really driven, really know what they want. We don't know what to do with women who are that way. And we tend to categorize them as difficult, and she definitely was difficult. And so I wanted to write a character like her. And this line I wrote on my waterproof notepad uh, is one that shows up on the first page of the book. And it says that she was as pale as an envelope and just as likely to inflict tiny cuts in inconvenient places. <laughs> and that, that was really her all over. You know, she could hurt your feelings a lot. The chocolate company certainly never wrote back. Um, <laughs> but. But she just, she thought it was important that people knew what was right and what was wrong. And that, that was a character I, I really felt that I could write about. Um, and so that's how the book started. And I gave her two daughters who are very different daughters, um, who have very different goals in life. And I gave her a husband who also was inspired uh, by, a, well, I guess not a real life character, but I, he's kind of, to me, Atticus Finch, in between To Kill a Mockingbird, which, you know, Scout thinks Atticus is this saint. You know, he's almost this asexual being. And then the, the character we meet, Atticus Finch, and Go Set a Watchman, right? I wanted him to fall somewhere in between those two people. And, and Rusty is a lawyer. He thinks that what he does is right and just, but a lot of times he's not right and just in his thinking. Uh, and it really came out of a conversation I had with Greg Isles. And I'm saying this because I checked and Greg Isles is not here. <laughs> uh, but I was at a dinner. There's, there's something called Thriller Fest, which is held in New York City every year. It's, if you, if you want to be a thriller writer, it's a really great opportunity. You know, you meet a lot of authors. You meet agents. 
They have something called Craft Fest. And there's actually been people who are very serious about writing who have attended this conference and ended up getting a book deal. So it's a very worthwhile thing to be a part of. Uh, but we were all at this author dinner, and Greg Isles was one of the authors. I won't name drop. I was probably the most famous one there. Um, <laughs> but our phones started buzzing because the excerpt in the New York Times of Ghost Set a Watchman had just been released, and it was revealed that Atticus Finch went to a Klan meeting. And Greg is from Mississippi. I don't want to punch down, but he's so country that sticks come out of his mouth when he talks. <laughs> Um, and I'm from Georgia, and we were really, other than Steve Berry, who now lives in Florida, so it doesn't count, we were the only Southerners there. And Greg and I got into this heated debate because he said, I don't think a man of Atticus Finch's education, intelligence, standing, family would ever do such a thing. And I had just done some research for a book that I had written called Cop Town about a guy named Leo Frank. And that name may sound familiar to some of you, especially those of you like me who love Lifetime movies. Uh, but Leo Frank was, in the early 1900s, a Jewish businessman from the Northeast who moved to Atlanta uh, and started working at a pencil factory. And one weekend, a young girl, I think she was 13, Mary Fagan, was defiled and murdered and left in this factory. And they couldn't uh, find any black people, so they did the next best thing. They found the Jewish guy from the north, and they pinned it on him. And he ended up being tried for this crime, but, but he was lynched. He was lynched by the townspeople. And there are photographs of his lynching. And his neck is literally stretched, and in fr standing in front of him with their guns and, you know, looking like, you know, they're happy about this. They're proud of, that they've just murdered a man in cold blood. You see the son of a United States senator, the sheriff, the um, policeman, the a local judge, a federal judge, all these men of the high rank in the community standing tall, standing proud in front of this murdered man. And so I thought, you know, that's the kind of character I want to write about. Is, and and I, I, didn't, I purposefully didn't choose it to be about racial differences because I feel like as a Southerner, uh, people, especially in, in, up at North, tend to think that racism only happens in the South when it happens everywhere. And so I didn't want that to be Rusty's fatal flaw. I wanted his fatal flaw to be that he thinks he's right about everything. And to me, that's a very destructive belief for anyone to have. You know, he never questions himself. He always thinks that he's on the side of good. And I talked to a lot of different lawyers when I was going to write the character of Rusty because I thought, you know, I, I write about a cop named Will Trent in my, my usual books. And I, I love being around police officers. I love talking to um, medical examiners and people who are in the business of crime solving. And everybody, I think, understands the job of a prosecutor because a prosecutor puts away the bad guys. And we watch Netflix and we see the West Memphis Three and we see what happened uh, in making a murderer and all that. And we think, oh, well, that's bad. Those are clearly bad prosecutors. And we, do, we like to think that they're an anomaly. Uh, but they exist. They exist more often than not, especially in small towns because it's an elected position. And many times, a prosecutor is incentivized to appear tough on crime. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is, you know, they want to keep getting elected. They want to keep their job. And two is, and this is very understandable to me, they don't want to let someone go for doing a crime and then have them commit a more heinous crime. And then people say, why did you let them go? Because everybody, if it's your cousin or your son or your father, you want leniency, you want you know, justice to be fair. But if it's somebody else's son or father, you want them to have the book thrown at them, right? I mean, that's just human nature. So I talk to a lot of different defense attorneys, and I live in Atlanta, and we have a lot of um, uh, athletes who live there, a lot of musicians. Justin Bieber lives there, for what that's worth. Um, you know, and they, they tend to get in trouble because they're not used to being called out for bad behavior. And so they get drug offenses or 
you know, they come and they play a game in our, our Georgia Stadium and they end up being charged with rape or they, you know, sometimes they murder people or they get accused of murdering people. And so we've got some really hot shot lawyers who deal with those people, right? And so I wanted to talk to that kind of lawyer. And I wanted to talk to the kind of lawyer that helps people who are basically without any help, you know, because the thing about the justice system is we don't spend a lot of money helping people uh, navigate their way through. I mean, every, I, I think a lot of people probably saw that 60 Minutes episode a, a few weeks back where there's one woman in Mississippi who's in charge of half the state and she has over 500 clients and that's the one person in Mississippi who is representing people who cannot afford a lawyer. So, you know, it makes you think twice about the, the criminal justice system. Uh, but so I wanted to talk to, to both ends of the spectrum. And, and this one woman I spoke to, she, was, she worked with juvenile offenders, and then she later became a, a judge in the juvenile courts. And she said, let me tell you something. I, I had a kid many years ago, and he was 16 years old, and he had cut grass and done chores and all that since he was 10 years old to save up to buy a car. And so his 16th birthday, he bought a car, uh, from somebody he didn't know, and he's driving home, and he gets caught speeding, right? So the cop pulls him over, and the kid's an idiot, so he mouths off to a cop, which you should never do, and the cop pulls him out of the car and searches the car. Well, he finds in the glove box a bag of pot that the kid had put in there, and then as he's searching the back seat, he finds another bag of pot that the previous owner had left in there by accident kid had no idea it was back there. So he went from being in a little trouble to looking at four years in big boy prison. And if you're not a criminal when you go into prison, you are when you come out. And this woman said, you know, I had to talk to the prosecutor and say, look, this is a good kid. He did something really stupid. Let's go, uh, let's talk about a diversion program. He's got family support. He's doing well in school. Let's not ruin his life. And she was able to negotiate him being on probation until he was 18, and then it was expunged. If this kid had not had that lawyer, he would have gone to prison. He would have been in prison for four years, and his life effectively would have been over. You know, he had enough drugs to justify a felony offense. And if you're a felon in Georgia, you can't vote, you can't qualify for housing assistance or food assistance. Uh, you, you know, there, there are all sorts of limitations that are put on you after you serve your time. You mean, it's, you're continually punished for it, and there's really no way to get out of it. So she said, to me, that is the point of my job. And I, I thought, well, that's something I can understand. So I'm going to make Charlie, who is one of Rusty's daughters, I'm going to make her that kind of attorney who looks at her job as just leveling the playing field. But then I had to talk to the hotshot lawyers because I wanted to get some idea of how these hotshot lawyers defend these people who, I mean, come on, we all know they're criminals, right? Uh, and so I said to this guy who had just gotten off um, some extremely wealthy drug dealer in Atlanta, uh, there was footage of him shooting a gun out the window of his car and he hit someone in the shoulder and this person was okay but the jury exonerated the shooter. That's how good this lawyer is, right? And I said to him, okay, well, how would you feel if this guy gets off, you got this guy off, he turns around and he does it again? And this hotshot lawyer said, well, you know what? It's not my job. It's the prosecutor's job. It's the police officer's job. It's the forensics people. It's the medical examiner. It's all of them. It is the state or the federal government's job to prove that he is guilty. So that's not my fault if they can't do that. And I thought, well, that's why everybody hates lawyers. <laughs> and that's the kind of lawyer I wanted to write about with Rusty. You know, and he'll take any case. He'll defend an abortion clinic or he'll defend someone who wants to bomb an abortion clinic. You know, he, he sees all sides and he wants everyone to have a great defense. And what he, the one thing that he is not is a good father because he spends most of his life trying to help other people, but he never turns around and sees that his daughter needs help. His daughters, rather, need help. And that all came out of a conversation with Greg Isles, uh, who I don't think in the book, but he should be glad I'm mentioning him now. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? 
I hope so. I'm coming. My publicist is here. She should have a question prepared. Why are you so young and beautiful? Well, oh, here, there you are. Thank you. Um, by the way, I love libraries also. When I was in my 50s, I went back for a master's in it. Good for just, you. Just for fun. But I've got to admit, I have never read a book of yours. Uh-oh. And I have read a lot of books. So I came today to hear you, so I'd say, well, do I want to read her books? And I do. You are wonderful. Oh, thank you. Can you advise my, here's my question. Okay. Can you advise me where to start? You have written so many. <laughs> well, you know, I really like my, my most recent one, The Good Daughter. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying that because it's the most expensive one out there. Um, but if you, if you want to just dip your toe in, well, you'll probably go to the library. It doesn't matter. Um, the, uh, a couple of books ago, I wrote a, a book called Pretty Girls, um, and it's, a, it's also about sisters, uh, but, but uh, three sisters, uh, one of them is dad, which I said to my sisters, if you don't like that, write your own book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I, I, I think that would probably be a good one to, to start with. I should say, I'm talking about all this uh, heady stuff, but there's really lots of sex and violence, too, so if that's your jam... <laughs> I can deal That's with that. That's a good one. I've had three sisters. Oh, you know, yeah. No one else? Oh, there you go. Hi. Um, I've read all of your books through audio, and I've heard this answer from a couple different authors as well, but I just wanted to hear your take on the performance they do on the audiobooks. Well, the woman who does my audiobooks is Kathleen Early. And I hope you like her. Uh, she's from Texas, uh, which is not technically the South, but I think she does the accents really good. Yeah. You know, it was really a, a bone of contention for me on my first audiobooks because they would get these really well-known actress, actresses who were Southern, but they would make my character sound like someone had shaken a trailer at a trailer park, and that's what fell out. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, there's just, and I say this knowing that Arkansas exists and there's no way to get rid of an Arkansas accent. <laughs> but, you know, different education levels connote different accents, and she gets that. So hopefully you're enjoying her. I, I, I think she does a good job. Yeah, definitely got me hooked on all Thank the you. Books. <laughs> you know, I was so excited when I saw you come to town um, that um, it's like, I guess it was only seeing Tina Turner. Tina Turner would be the only thing that's exciting for me. <laughs> anyway, are you making too much money writing books to go on a trail for comedy? Because you, uh, you could do stand-up, I tell you. Well, well thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> yes. So I recently read uh, the late Pat Conroy's book about reading and how he got started. And it's a fascinating book, how his mother read to him, teachers that intervened in his life and how much he reads. I recommend that book to anyone who hasn't read it, but I'm curious in, in your life, how much you read and, and what you read. How do you, do, how do you decide what to read? You know, I read anything that strikes my fancy. I, re I read a lot of nonfiction. I, I just read about the Attica uprising. Uh, I thought that was fascinating. I read a lot of the authors who are here at the festival, Diana Gabaldon. Um, I love Lee Child. I have his new book at home. It's not on me, so don't rush me. Um, I, just, I just love reading, and I spend a, a great deal of time reading. I think it's really important to do that, because the reason I want to be a writer is I read books and I loved them. So it's a very important part of my life. Thank you. And, and I'm, I'm kind of up there in age, so I can probably get away with saying this. You look fabulous. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Anyone can say that, actually. Do we have time for one more question? or Fast, fast. Oh, I wanted to say, I'm from the South also, uh, but I wanted to say that I think we had the same ninth grade English teacher. <laughs> you described her perfectly, and she did change my life, and um, I thank her for it every day. Um, but you have such a wonderful uh, sense of humor, and you are really funny. And I'm, and, but your books seem like, pretty dark subjects, and I was just wondering if you include that wonderful sense of humor in Well, I books. think they're funny. Uh, 
I, you know, the thing is, most crime writers are really laid back. It's the romance writers you have to watch out for. <laughs> And I, I think it's because we get it out on the page. You know, I mentioned Lee Child. Mike Connolly is a teddy bear. Jeff Deaver shows dogs. I mean, we're, we're really mostly just nice, laid-back people. But, you know, you read our books and you think, wow, should you really be out in the world? <laughs> My answer is yes. Do, can we get this one woman here? No, that's it. I'm sorry. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.